Good afternoon. I'm Donald Mastronardi, Emeritus Professor of Ancient Greek and Roman Studies and President of the Executive Council of the Campus Chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, Alpha of California. On behalf of the chapter and the College of Letters and Science, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second in a series of four public lectures we have arranged to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the founding of the chapter. In this series, in accordance with Phi Beta Kappa's dedication to liberal arts education, we aim to highlight the vast range of intellectual curiosity and research excellence for which Berkeley is famous. Let me begin by saying our Phi Beta Kappa chapter and the College of Letters and Science acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Hui Chin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of co community inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible universities' relationship to native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognize that the Wemke Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Before beginning the program, I want to thank Executive Dean of Letters and Science, Jennifer Johnson Hanks, who was herself a member of Phi Beta Kappa, inducted at Berkeley, for co-sponsoring these lectures. I also want to thank the staff who have assisted us with publicity, uh, particularly Michelle Phillips and Lauren Miller of Letters and Science, and Jane Fink of the Graduate Division. I'm also grateful to our chapter's program administrator, Chris Carlisle, for his manifold assistance in getting this series organized. Now, I'm delighted that Chancellor Carol Christ has found time in her busy schedule to attend this event and say a few words to us. She is also a member of Phi Beta Kappa. I want to acknowledge here that throughout her career, and particularly in the unusually challenging years of her chancellorship, she has embodied the Phi Beta Kappa ideal, combining scholarship with public engagement and public service. I know we all wish her well for the remainder of her term and for whatever lies after that. Carol. Thank you. I'm really glad to add my welcome to Professor Mastronardi's to this Phi Beta Kappa lecture. Phi Beta Kappa was founded in 1776, which is, of course, the same year as the Declaration of Independence. It was founded at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, which is, was at that time the capital of Virginia and really a cradle of the American Revolution. Both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson lived there. It was founded as what we would term now a student org. It was a group of young men in those times who um, were fed up with the dissipation and drinking and partying of the current student clubs and decided they wanted something more serious. So they founded a, a secret society. It was originally a secret society that was a debating society around philosophical issues. Perhaps the most famous Phi Beta Kappa uh, lecture of all times is Ralph Waldo Emerson's The American Scholar, which was delivered at Harvard in 1837. And it was, it's a kind of American declaration of independence from Europe. In it, Emerson argues that there are three elements that go into the education of a scholar, books, nature, and action. He says books are the least important Nature is far more important, of which we'll be hearing something today, and most important of all is action. So I am so delighted to join you today in this wonderful tradition of the Phi Beta Kappa Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. In the spring of 1898, at the urging of Martin Kellogg, who was then president of the University of California, several members of the Berkeley faculty who had been initiated into Phi Beta Kappa elsewhere petitioned the National Council of Phi Beta Kappa Society for the establishment of a chapter at the university. In response, a chapter was granted on September 7th of 1898, and Alpha of California was organized at Berkeley on the 14th of December of that year. So this lecture is the closest in date to that actual anniversary. 
The name Alpha of California designates that this is the first chapter established in California, and it happens to be the first created west of the Rockies. The chapter is managed by a small committee of Phi Beta Kappa members on the faculty and staff. Each year we select for invitation to join Phi Beta Kappa several hundred high-achieving graduating seniors and a few juniors who have completed a broad program of studies with distinction. We also raise money for graduate fellowships to be awarded to Phi Beta Kappa members who are completing a PhD at Berkeley. We also use our funds uh, supplemented by a contribution from the College of Letters and Science for induction fee waivers for students with financial need. More details about the history of Phi Beta Kappa and of the chapter can be found in the 100th anniversary booklet compiled in, 18, uh, in 1998, uh, which can be downloaded at our website. Uh, that was the history there was compiled by Emeritus Professor Basil Guy. During our year anniversary year, we are also in the process of compiling an honor roll of Phi Beta Kappa members who are currently part of our campus community, whether faculty or staff or graduate students. If you were inducted into Phi Beta Kappa at your undergraduate institution, we invite you to self-identify by visiting pbk.berkeley.edu and using the link on the homepage uh, near the top to access the brief, brief form to add your name. Now, the second speaker in our series of anniversary lectures uh, is by Professor Saul Perlmutter of Physics. Professor Perlmutter graduated from Harvard and received his PhD from Berkeley. He's an experimental uh, astrophysicist and shared the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of the d accelerating expansion of the university universe. Among <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we sometimes our expansion has been, uh, but mostly it's our deficit that is expanding that way. Uh, among many other le leadership roles, he is now the leader of the International Supernova Cosmology Project. I'm delighted to announce that as of today, he has been uh, inducted as an honorary member of Alpha of Ka Phi Beta Kappa Alpha of California. I could go on much longer about his achievements, his research publications, but it's better to proceed to the lecture so that we'll have plenty of time to enjoy uh, the question and answer and the reception that follows in the lobby. Professor Plurmutter has had a long-standing interest in teaching scientific style critical thinking for scientists and non-scientists alike, and that is the inspiration of his lecture today. Good afternoon, and uh, I, I loved uh, hearing the, uh, the history of uh, Phi Beta Kappa. I realized that the talk that I was going to give today is actually very, very appropriate because um, I think it's, I was hoping to begin a conversation um, with, with the audience here and I guess those who are on the web uh, on the question of what should we be teaching nowadays um, when we teach science uh, in, in schools and in universities. And I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, suggest um, that there's several motivations for uh, a sort of new direction that we should be, we should be thinking about nowadays in, with respect to science education. And the first motivation is something that I think we're all very familiar with, which is that science is advancing so rapidly nowadays. Uh, there's, and, and each of these new fields and subtopics has the potential of actually making a very big difference in the lives of, of citizens, uh, uh, of you know, whatever fields they end up going into themselves. But there are way too many topics that you should be teaching um, that could be just as important uh, for students to be learning about as physics, chemistry, and biology. I mean, just you know, relatively recently, obviously, AI, uh, CRISPR, uh, gene editing, um, quantum cryptography. You know, these, these are all things that could end up becoming as important to teach as, as the traditional subjects that are being taught in a, in a, uh, as a part of standard education in science. Um, now, the good news. Uh, is that nowadays there are many ways to learn these topics. Uh, you know, I, I watch my daughter going on the web and taking a whole course in, in any topic that she, she cares about. And so in some sense, you could argue that, well, people can find uh, access to all, all these topics and they can find all the you know, uh, facts and figures that go, that go with them as well. Um, so what's the problem? Well, the second motivation here is that although we have this you know, plethora of riches of, of, uh, of with what you can find on, on the web nowadays, it's very difficult for people to figure out what's important, um, what they should, they should actually be believing. And, uh, and we do realize that we live in a world that people become then very vulnerable to all sorts of fads um, at best and uh, conspiracy theories and just plain lies at worst. And this is clearly in our society um, led to this degree of, uh, at least partly led to this degree of polarization 
um, that just gridlocks almost any advances uh, over almost any topic that we care about. And at times when I've been giving uh, talks about this in other parts of the world, I felt a little bit embarrassed to be, you know, showing our, our dirty laundry in, in, of the US. Um, but of course, what people say to me is that they're seeing the same things in, in other parts of the world as well. And so this isn't, isn't just a local problem. Um, now, you know, we really, I think, had this highlighted for us um, during the last you know, years uh, of when, when we were going through the pandemic. Um, and we were watching a, a period in which, while we had just discovered ways to deal with, with the pandemic, people were uncomfortable getting vaccinated. And it was, you know, a lot was due to information that they were apparently finding, you know, on, on the web. Uh, even maybe more surprising is that people then start believing these weird, bizarre connections between the possibility of, uh, you know, COVID have something to do with, I don't know, the, the, uh, cell phone, you know, 5G. Uh, I, and, uh, but taking it seriously enough that there were attacks on, you know, on 5G, on the, on cell phone masts in several countries around the world. And you, you just wouldn't have thought that that would be the world that we would have advanced to as we had a science, you know, science that reached this level that we were also, uh, able to, you know, pr produce a vaccine in, in that record time. And so you can see that in some sense, things like the pandemic are not just a crisis of scientific knowledge, but they're clearly um, just as much, if not more so, a crisis of public decision making you know, in this kind of this highly uncertain polarized, polarized world. And of course, it's not just uh, pandemics that we worry about. There's you know, all sorts of major issues in the world that we want to be able to deal with. And you know, each of them um, is, is something that we struggle over if we don't have a way of, of making rational uh, decisions together as, as a society. I, I've sometimes been pointing out that you know, for me, all of these very scary existential threats, um, I don't think they would be scary to me if I felt that we were even reasonably on the same page. Um, I think that we actually have the capability, uh, perhaps for the first time ever, um, of being able to take on these kinds of challenges. And I think they're the kind of challenges that are just about at the size that we're pretty good at if we're on the same page together and if we have ways to work together. So this seemed, in the end, I was describing this as, I think this may be the greatest challenge of our generation. If we can figure out some way to get past this, this period and get to the point that you can have some kind of collective conversation, um, I, I think uh, you know, that, would, that would make me feel like we have solved the major problems or that we will solve them. All right, that brings me to the third motive then for reconsidering science education, which is that I actually believe that we have the peace, the peace build, the, the possibility today to um, work on this puzzle using the intellectual methodologies of science um, that have allowed us to make all these great scientific advances. But I think they also now could be applied to this problem of, of a larger collective decision making and, uh, and collective thinking. Um, and if that is the case, then this has got to be the most underutilized part of, of, of what our science offers in an education. And, and so that's, that's the, I know, perhaps provocative premise that I'm going to try out on you. And, uh, and I'd like to hear, you know, what, what people think. Um, all right. So typically I, I give a talk, um, about the expansion of the universe. And as, as, as you know, uh, I've been, you know, interested in the question of, you know, what, why is the universe apparently, uh, now speeding up and it used to be slowing down and university apparently too. Um, and <laughs> the, but so I won't be talking about that today. Um, but I, but I think, and, and but I've got to, you know, answer questions about it afterwards if you are curious, um, or come back and someday and give a, a talk on the other one. But, um, but I just want to point out that this uh, has, in some sense, made me very aware of how, as scientists, you do spend a lot of time thinking about what is the reality of, of what you're, of what you're trying to study. And, uh, you know, what, what is, where does it mean that you're, that you think you understand this about, about the world? And I've, you know, come to think that in some ways, the difficulties that we have in trying to figure out what is credible on the web, on the internet, um, has interesting parallels with trying to figure out what is credible um, in our picture of scientific reality. And some of the, the, uh, the parallels are sort of obvious. I mean, first, in both cases, we have a tendency to look for famous authorities um, and to see whether we can trust, trust them. Um, there's also, we tend to look for indications of popularity, what's high up on the rankings of the, uh, of the web pages. Um, but, and it's not that those are, you know, that those are bad ways, um, in general, um, to try to learn something about what to, what to trust. It's just that you don't want to stop there. And you certainly would never have wanted us to have stopped, um, with 
know, Aristotle's view of, of physics as, as, you know, where we, where we, we, we finished, right? That was a, a beginning point. And you don't want your latest fashionable rumor to be the basis for choosing your medical treatment. Um, clearly, th those are things that we've learned that there's better ways to, 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 to do the job. And science has dealt with this problem um, over, well, centuries, um, probably, probably back to uh, ancient Greeks, by developing different ways to start asking more method methodically about um, you know, what, what is it that we, what is, how do we approach the problem, but not with a single method. And I think that uh, we've all were at one point, or at least you know, a generation of us were taught in high school or earlier that there is a scientific method. And I think that that's not really what I'm talking about here. Uh, you know, that's more of a, of a whole collection of methodologies and, a, and, a, and tricks of the trade um, that I think together make what it is that I think the science has, has taken on as a, a way to approach this problem of what to believe about the world. There are trends, and uh, there, I so loosely hold them together with uh, some themes like, first, we are amazingly good at fooling ourselves, and uh, that you know, much of what we've been doing in these techniques of science is developing approaches to how to find and recognize um, when it is that this sort of situation leads us to fool ourselves in this way, and then also develop tools and, and tricks that will keep us from avoiding that particular way of fooling ourselves this time. Um, and then you know, many of them have this characteristic of recognizing where we, are, we have our strengths and weaknesses uh, physically with our uh, senses, and, where, and, and how to shore up the, uh, the weaknesses and build to the strengths. And so the techniques, I think, have a lot of, in common in, in this sense. Um, so if you ask them, what do these tools look like? Um, this was a question that I found myself asking, now it's over 10 years ago, uh, when I, I was, I think, at one point aware of, of, uh, of watching our society try to make a decision about something very practical, like what should the appropriate debt ceiling be? Um, and I, you, you'd be shocked to hear that at that time, people were having a hard time deciding what was the right level for the debt ceiling. Um, and the, looking at the form of the, of the conversation and the discussion about it, I was struck by the fact that the debate sounded nothing like the conversations I was hearing um, over issues like this um, at a lunch table discussion with a bunch of scientists um, at, you know, at the lab. And you would, you would, I realized that the terminologies and the ideas of how people approach the problem just felt very different. Um, and I was wondering, well, where did these scientists learn this, these approaches and in this methodology? And I realized it was not in any science course that I had ever taken, uh, either in high school or in college, and uh, that it was really being taught currently um, as sort of a osmosis process uh, while people went through the, uh, going through graduate school and postdocing and maybe as young faculty members, and acculturation um, and that you picked up from the people around you and from your advisors. And little by little, you learned a, a lot of this almost terminology as much as everything else that people then would use to approach a problem and ask questions about any topic. And it could be a recent Supreme Court decision. It could be a, you know, a medical issue. Um, but they, you would just assume that people would all have these ideas in their mind. And it seemed like a real shame that, first of all, I didn't learn any of them until I got, you know, started going through graduate school and afterwards. I was not getting any of this as an undergraduate in, in courses and in, in sciences. And for that matter, why shouldn't you even have learned it much younger th th than that? And then, if you didn't go on in the sciences, um, it, it, it would be, you know, it would be more hit or miss whether you would ever happen to pick up some of these particular ideas. So I thought, well, shouldn't we find a way to collect them and, uh, and, uh, see whether you could articulate them and could they be possibly taught at, at a much younger age. I then realized that it's not good enough um, just as a physicist to try and come up with that collection of ideas um, that you know, a physics faculty meeting can go as irrationally as any other faculty meeting. Um, so it, it seemed to me that it would, be, it would be good to bring others into the game. And so I found a professor, other faculty in the, well, social psychology, because that seemed very relevant, philosophy, uh, public policy actually also. and also put up a sign um, for, for others uh, asking, saying, are you, are you embarrassed watching our society make, make these decisions? Um, come help invent a course. Come help save the world. And about 30 uh, mostly graduate students, some undergraduates, some postdocs started showing up. Um, and we started meeting at the end of Fridays. Um, I don't know why. And, and uh, we, we begin like at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we go on until you know, eventually people get starving and they go, go home for dinner. But and we, were run we would meet every week for with like nine months um, as 
this group just tried to figure out what would a minimal set of ideas be. And the idea is that they shouldn't be, comp shouldn't be necessarily comprehensive. Obviously, we weren't going to get everything. But what would make a nice, interesting starting point? And are there ways to teach it? So that led to the uh, big idea course here at Berkeley, um, Sense and Sensibility in Science, which made a lot of sense as a name back when, when students were reading Jane Austen. Um, I gather it's, <laughs> I've had a harder time trying to uh, explain it lately. Um, and over the, over the years now, it, we've taught it uh, now, what, nine times? It's in, in 10 years or something like that. Um, and it's always, we've always had one natural scientist, one social scientist, and one humanities faculty member in the room at any given moment so that we would model conversations that we thought were important for the students to, to have a chance to sort of see us inter, you know, discussing things and debating things with each other. Um, and over the years, we've swapped out different uh, social scientists, different uh, philosophers. Um, and so it's been now a, a product, actually, of, of a number of, of, uh, of, of Berkeley uh, faculty uh, over this period and, uh, and cohorts of students who have become very involved in it, uh, many of whom stay and then help teach and help developing the course for the following years. Um, so in that sense, it's been a real uh, uh, you know, labor of love for, for a lot of people at, at Berkeley over, over this time. And what we've um, ended up uh, identifying was Maybe at, at the time that that group was beginning to meet, we ended up uh, interviewing almost uh, two dozen topics that every class teaches one of them. And we worked on trying to develop ways to make the, each of the classes experiential in the sense that you wouldn't just lecture about it, but you would actually do activities, games, discussions, where ideally you might fall into one of these mental traps and then try to figure out how you get out of them, um, with the goal being that you would uh, have a, enough of visceral understanding of the problems that when you saw it in your day-to-day -day life um, or when you heard about something in, on, in the news, um, you would recognize that, ah, that's that issue coming up again. So you would transfer it to these other, other situations. The, you can roughly group these into these uh, topic areas, um, but let me try and rearrange this a little bit to, uh, to, to capture the structure of what we were doing. So first, um, there on the upper left are, are sort of the um, cautionary aspects of science, the, the things that, that, um, uh, that you have to watch out for, and that's then balanced by some of the can-do aspects of science. And, uh, and, and I'll give maybe one or two examples of, of, of each of these different categories just to get a feel for the, for the kinds of things we, we'd be teaching. Um, you know, beginning with the, with the... Oops, going the wrong way, way here a second. Uh, beginning with the, um, the underpinnings, uh, they're, they're typically the sort of philosophical underpinnings of, of what we're doing as scientists. One that seemed very important was um, to get across the idea that, that even though we often think of the world as, well, you have your beliefs, I have my beliefs, you know, we just have to you know, follow what we believe, um, scientists tend not to have worked that way. The way that we've tended to have made progress is to think that there is some reality out there, um, some common reality, and there is a point in trying to argue it together until we figure out what that reality is. That's not good enough just to go off to my corner and say, well, I guess you believe your thing, I believe my thing. That that isn't how we've actually made, made our advances. And so th that um, is, is, is something that um, is surprisingly changes in, over the years as to whether the undergraduates um, find that surprising or find that, uh, you know, that oh, yes, of course. Um, and, and I think that that isn't, a, it, it's, but it is something that has to be spoken about and thought through. Um, we've also uh, been using the, the model of, uh, of, of knowledge of, you know, thinking of the, uh, it's not really so much a pyramid of knowledge that science is built up on where you, you know, begin with some base elements that you, you, know, you can now trust and then you build on top of them and you build on top of them, but more of the mo model of the raft of knowledge where there's many woven pieces that together make a coherent whole, but that any one piece could be brought out and tested and asked, well, maybe this one's wrong, and you might have to put, put something else in instead. Um, but at any given moment, you're still floating on your raft um, with you know, most of the other pieces in, in, in place. But you, you do take very seriously the possibility that you know, something as fundamental as uh, you know, a gravity um, has to be reconsidered. Um, and it's not that you then ground all the airplanes while you wait until you figure out you know, why Newtonian gravity is, is, you know, is or isn't right, um, and, and, and that Einsteinian uh, general relativity you know, might be the answer. Um, but you have enough of the pieces that are all in place that you can, you can trust that you'll, that you'll float, meanwhile, while you're reconsidering any, any individual element. So these are the kinds of, of, of elements that we thought is just helpful for people to understand are going into uh, the background of what we're doing. Uh, when we're doing science. Causal reasoning, of course, um, you know, everybody knows uh, that you shouldn't take 
um, correlation to mean causation. Um, but we had to discuss, well, what does, it, what does it mean when you can't do a fully randomized controlled trial, um, and that there are other ways to establish causation. And so we, we teach a little about, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, my field of, of cosmology wouldn't exist if you had to only do randomized control trials. And so you do need other mechanisms. Uh, yeah, right. So, so that was one of the el other elements that we, that we thought was uh, important to, to get across. Um, a clear, huge part of what scientific thinking involves is probabilistic thinking, that we don't think of things as binary, you know, true, falses, yes and no's for, for the most part. Um, we're typically uh, using probabilistic styles in all sorts of ways. We begin, you know, parts of the course, we're, we're teaching um, the reasons, the, the ways in which we've learned that we fool ourselves by, uh, by you know, looking, when we're looking for signal in noise, what do we mean by signal? Um, what do we mean by noise? Um, you know, in what ways will you think you see signal when what you're really seeing is fluctuations in noise? And that you know, then ties into the fact that we see patterns in random noise um, much more easily uh, than, than you might expect. And so a lot of what scientists have often developed is a bit of a sense for how often will you actually see a whole run of, of heads in a row, um, and that it's not as rare as you might imagine, and therefore you might need to use statistics. So in a course like this, we don't actually teach much of the statistics at all, but we're teaching what it is that you're watching out for that makes you go and learn some statistics, <laughs> or what situations do you want to not be trusting your gut instinct for and think that, oh, I, I know what's going on here, but that you actually need to do something that's a little bit more rigorous th than that. Now, maybe even more important from probabilistic thinking is just the idea that almost any Id proposition that you hold, you hold with some probabilistic uh, confidence. So we assign credence levels to, to this. And that's very important because you know, it could be that you're 99.99999% sure, and you'll bet your life on it. You'll, you'll get on that airplane, and you're, you'll be pretty sure that it's going to fly. Um, but, um, but just the idea that you take all these points as having some degree of confidence or not makes it much more possible to be open to, ch to being wrong and to possibly changing your mind about something. And, uh, and so that seems like a very key part of what it means to be doing the style of sci scientific thinking, that you have to be able to consider the possibilities of, of being wrong. Now, this is an example of where the uh, kinds of, of, uh, of games that we play and the kinds of activities that we did in the class um, was aimed at giving a bit of experiential feel for this. Here we came up with a game where you would organize little small discussions between uh, groups in the, in the class um, where they would take a proposition like, um, has the increased use of standardized testing in the US elementary schools improved the quality of education or made it worse? But well, during the conversation, any statement you make that could have a truth value, um, you give a number um, uh, after, at, the end of your, uh, at the end of your sentence. So you know, most teachers have now begun to teach what they think will be on the test rather than what they think is the most important material to teach. 82, um, indicating your degree of confidence on a scale from you know, 0 to 100. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, a silly game to start with. Um, but what we find is that when the students play the game and, and, and work through it, um, that afterwards they, they find themselves realizing that they were not as confident about things that they, were, they would have ordinarily argued with some you know, great uh, conviction. And that they, you know, they only had 82% uh, confidence in saying that they, that they were there. And therefore, you might have to consider the other 18% a possibility that the world is different than they were originally stating, in which case there might be a different way of thinking about the problem. So that the students found that that is actually a very interesting way to, to, to make them aware of, of, of uh, where their standings are in, in, in these discussions, and that it could be actually an interesting way to have real conversations with people if you get anybody to stick around long enough to, to do it with you. Um, all right, so these were some of the sort of cautionary parts. Um, now, you can't you know, drive a car with just brakes of cautionary elements. Um, you do need you know, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the accelerator pedal of the can-do aspects of science. And so we thought it was important to teach some things that I've never seen actually expressed and, and taught specifically. Uh, one is the thing we were calling scientific optimism, which we introduced by asking, you know, what is the second longest time you've ever spent trying to solve a puzzle? Um, that was second longest because we didn't want the one time you got obsessed, maybe, but we wanted some more typical. Um, and so the, the question, the question is, you know, I, you guys you can all think about this as, as well. Um, most of the students you know, were answering, well, you know, sometimes they spent as much as you know, several hours, you know, maybe, uh, maybe even more than a day. Um, you know, on the, it's, very, it's rare that people found themselves thinking about, yeah, I guess I remember spending several you know, months or years you know, on, 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 some, on some problem. And 
the idea is to highlight the fact that a lot of the way science works is, uh, is getting comfortable with the idea that most interesting problems don't solve themselves very easily. And yet, if you stick to them long enough, you actually can get somewhere if you have that confidence that you will be able to solve problems. And it's one of the ones that I found that when you talk to, uh, phys to science faculty, a lot of what they're doing, and I, and I think it may be in other fields as well, a lot of what you're doing as a uh, mentor for grad students is getting them past the point where, to, where they say, I, I tried it, I gave up, it didn't work, you know, and get them to be comfortable with the idea that it won't work you know, for a while. And, but you stick to things much longer than it feels like you should stick to them. It's not that you never give up on something. You don't want to hit your head against a, you know, a wall when, when something's not doable. It's just that most of us aren't aware of how, um, how much a problem requires to, to actually make, to make some progress on it. And that you have to be fooling yourself into thinking you can solve it long enough to actually solve it. And, and so that was uh, the, the element you know, here in, in, in play. Um, other aspects of the can do aspect of science we were teaching having to do with you know, techniques for estimation that allow you to get a grip on a problem um, rather early without having really solved the problem. And so, so there's a few of these things in play. Um, now, in the end, we want to bring together these can-do aspects and these cautionary aspects and do something with it. And so we come down here to where uh, you want to actually make some decisions to do something with it. And then, of course, you run into all the issues of what happens when, when humans think through problems and the, the problems of, of human cognition. Now, many of you will you know, recognize the, you know, the availability of representative anchoring heuristic and biases from the kind of uh, uh, thinking fast and slow um, discussions that Danny Kahneman you know, would, would, have, would have raised. Um, but we, uh, and we do discuss some of that in the course. Um, here, I was just going to focus in on one of them, the confirmation bias, um, that since that's become a, a very visible one, of course, in our world today, it's very easy to look through the web until you find something that you agree with and then think you found some evidence for your, your point. Um, in particular, science has come across a rather interesting way of fooling yourself um, with confirmation bias, which is that if you are doing any complex analysis, um, you will be trying to figure out where you're making mistakes. And I don't think most people uh, have thought about this way, but I'd say probably 90, whatever, 98% of the time uh, as a scientist, what you're doing is trying to figure out where you're making a mistake and where you're going wrong. And so you're you know, often trying to figure out, is this data point you know, good? Is this analysis right? Um, there's a confirmation bias danger, which is that if anything that's at all complex, you will hunt for all the things that are wrong when you have a result that just looks weird. And you, you, know, you tell your, your grad student, well, you can't go to the conference and show that plot. It's going to just be embarrassing unless, unless you, you, know, you really check, check for this bug on the computer program, check for this thing that may be wrong with our scientific setup. Um, but if you see a plot that looks like what you expected and you need something to show at the next conference and, uh, and perhaps it even might uh, back up some new theory that you have, um, there's a temptation to say, well, I guess we've found all the bugs. We're done. Look, it looks great. And there is clear evidence when you go back through the scientific literature that that's going on um, and that people are, and it's done by great scientists. I mean, so you see excellent work done by excellent people, but you go back and you analyze the data afterwards in retrospect, once you know you know, what we now know, let's say 25 years later, and you can see all sorts of evidence for people having stopped looking for bugs at the point at which they got the answer that they, that they were, uh, thought they might get, or they're interested in getting. And, um, and I've, I've now gone and analyzed, you know, my uh, competing group's work and seen this thing, and I felt very smug. And then I analyzed, uh, then went back and looked at our own work, one, which we, uh, which we done, and I found er errors that clearly looked like the same kind of error. Um, so I've come to the point now, and this is something that started in I mean, particle physics uh, first, um, of, of using new techniques. Um, there's a technique that's called blind analysis, um, which was just in the last probably 20, 15 years or so, becoming more and more the accepted norm in certain areas of particle physics. And the idea being that you have to figure out ways to check all of your analyses without getting to see the answer. Um, and it's tricky. There's clever ways to do it. Um, but I've now come to believe that if I don't do it, I don't really trust my, my own results, let alone anybody else's results. And so we've, started, we've introduced it into cosmology. It's starting to be taken up by my, many of the cosmology teams as well. It hasn't yet spread to the rest of, 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 the, uh, of the sciences necessarily. Um, just to give you a little more feel for this, uh, in, I'll just give you one of the stories from my own field of, of um, cosmology, um, which was the measurement that was done over the uh, last 100 years of the current expansion rate of the universe. Um, so what is its current speed of expansion? And 
Uh, you know, so this isn't the whole thing I was describing earlier of accelerating and all that, but this is just what is it doing today? And you can see the numbers, you know, were way off uh, and then started moving around um, in, since the 1920s when they first tried to measure this. Um, and then in the more recent period, let me just blow up uh, this region over here, um, and you'll see something rather interesting going on. Um, in, so between like the 70s and the, uh, and the 90s. Um, and this is that if you uh, look at the papers and the values they were getting, there's this unusual trend, which is that one team work always got numbers around 100, and another team's work always got numbers around 50. And these actually were both excellent teams. And you look at the papers, and they've been correctly identifying errors in the other team's <laughs> results. Um, and then, you know, and, but the unfortunate thing was during that period, you knew who wrote the paper based on what the, the value was um, that, that you got. And clearly, um, there's something going wrong with this, with this um, science, even though when you look at each thing they're doing, they all sound right um, individually. And, and of course, I think what's missing in this case was clearly the, the blind analysis. Um, so, so as I said, I, I now have come to think that you have to be using it. Um, when I was talking about this in this class uh, at Berkeley, the social psychologist, um, Rob McCoon, at the time, um, said, you know, you know, we're having this replication crisis in our field right now, and that we're not able to replicate you know, experiments. We should really be using this blind analysis technique. Could you help write an article? So we wrote this article together for Nature, um, trying to, uh, to discuss you know, how you could try to bring it into the other field. And um, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the other one that's being used for a similar purpose is pre-registration for those people who've been following the story. And just a week or so ago, um, I was very happy to see that there was a paper out in, Nat in Science magazine where they showed that in the, during the replication crisis, they were getting like 30% to 50% um, replicability that you could actually believe a result when somebody else did it, um, that they would get the same result that another group had found. When you use techniques like this blind analysis or pre registration, um, they were now getting like 97% or something like that um, replicability, that you actually were um, apparently now beginning to get results that you might be able to trust. So that was, that was nice, nice to, to have seen. All right, by getting a little sidetracked, um, this is, that was individual um, human cognition as well. There's a next question about what happens when you need to make a decision as a group. And here, one thing I thought was, you know, there's all these interesting discussions about wisdom of crowd versus herd thinking, optimal ways for groups to make decisions. But what I, what we really, what I want to um, bring up here is that in the end of the day, if you've taught all this other rationality, um, it makes no difference whatsoever if when people actually get into a decision-making mode with others, um, it gets all overtaken by everybody's fears and goals and, and ambitions and um, and of course, fears, goals, and ambitions, and, and values are what brought people into a room to make a decision. So those aren't going to go away. Um, the thing that you could lose is the rationality. And so unless you have principled ways to weave the values and the fears and the goals together with the rational elements of the, that underpin a decision, um, then the thing you're going to lose is the rationality. So although at one point I thought this wasn't the job of, a, of the you know, teaching scientific techniques um, to, to get into decision-making approaches. Um, in the end, I came to the conclusion that you know, if we don't take that seriously and we don't think about how we do that in a principled way, um, then we're not really doing the job of teaching ration, you know, ra rational thinking in any way, or critical thinking. So, um, so we've introduced into the course a lot of the different uh, best practices, different experiments that people have been trying. There's some very optimistic ones, techniques that called the, like deliberative polling, I think is a very interesting one to, to look at if you ever get a chance to, to look it up. Um, ways that are bring in expertise and bring in um, a representative, uh, you know, statistically representative body to, to do it, make a decision using those two together. Um, so you get the values and you get the, uh, the uh, facts you know, and, and, and the, of, of the story um, in the decision at the same time. And then finally, I, was just, uh, I won't spend extra time on today, but I'll just say that we do spend a little bit of time on this topic of when is science suspect. Because uh, we don't, you know, by this point in the course, you might start to think that we're is basic science boosterism. If it has name science, it must be good, you know. And so we want to um, at least have the, that moment where we remember uh, and look at the ways in which science goes wrong, um, you know, including uh, some of the terrible um, ways in, you know, in, in history where, uh, you know, studies of human subgroups have been a, a, a nice tool for oppression of, of one sort or another. And we thought it's just important that people have their antenna up um, and recognize the, the ways in which um, that you, you had seen very serious failure modes 
of, of science if we're going to be describing you know, this whole uh, thing as a, as a product of science. So this is the, the feel of the course. Um, now, you know, there are many more uh, you know, topics un un underneath all this. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if you're curious, yeah, we, we, you, I'll, I'll point you later to the, to the web page. Um, and you can go and see, you know, what, what all these different uh, topics are that we, uh, that we end up um, covering in the course. The question I want to ask now, though, is um, with this vocabulary of science, if, if you have it in hand, um, how would it make uh, a next generation of citizens um, act differently? What, what could this do for us? And I first, you know, would like to imagine, um, and I've sometimes talked about it in a grandiose way to the students in the course, that, you know, someday they will all be in Congress and they'll be making decisions and you'd like the congressmen to all have this uh, vocabulary because they've all taken these courses and they will be using this, you know, these ideas as they try to decide what's the right, you know, course of action. And we want them to be, you know, interested in sharing a realistic sh shared picture of the world together. We want them to be using probabilistic thinking, not just you know, these uh, black and white, you know, I, I'm certain I know the answer, um, to be aware that they could be mistaken and that the way to figure out if you're mistaken is to actually um, find other people to help tell you where you're going wrong, not to find other people to, to, to yell at them until they believe that you're right. And just, you know, those, that as a starting point, I think would already be uh, salutary. Um, we would like citizens to feel like they have a way to what they're looking for in an expert when they, when they um, go for expert uh, suggestions. They, you presumably want the ones who recognize all the ideas that we just talked about in, this, uh, in developing this course. Um, so they, they should understand probabilistic thing themselves. They should be open to others' contributions. Um, they should perhaps have this can-do spirit that might allow you to be, uh, consider enlarging the pie when there's a problem that might be a, uh, otherwise a zero-sum game. Um, so you have, uh, there, there's something that you're, you, you want to see in the people that you're going to trust to give advice. And you would like these to be shared skills so that people can use them together constructively. Um, so that was the, you know, the uh, s somewhat uh, picture of what kind of society you might be trying to build if you were successfully educating with, with these, these approaches. All right, so with that motivation, you could ask, well, where and how can we get these ideas um, out into a world so that someday, 20 years from now, um, we all feel safe when we look to see what, our, what, what is our Congress you know, uh, uh, voting on uh, to, you know, today. Um, we we have taken the material of this course and, uh, and just in the last few weeks finished proofreading the galleys of a, of a book. So, um, so you should see this sometime in bookstores in, uh, in the spring, I guess, or something like that. So, so there might be one way that people will get it for those people who still read books. Um, I, guess, I, I guess actually we're also auditioning the people who do the audio. So maybe that, you know, some people listen to the books. Yeah. Um, so, that, so we're hoping that will be out, be out uh, and, and, and that will be a route. But we've been obviously working very hard on this question of can we um, teach this in a educational context, um, in courses, in schools. Um, so there's this political problem that trying to teach anything in a, uh, in, or take anything into a high school um, in our country and probably most parts of the world um, it's, it's very difficult to see, you know, how do you get something into the curriculum? And, uh, for, and in one route that we realized does get through to schools all over the world without going through the, the political problems is the Nobel Prize uh, websites. Um, they, every year, teachers download their material and just, and just use it. So we, we went and spoke to the Nobel Prize Foundation, asked them would they be interested in helping to develop this, and they've joined us in starting now to work on a high school version of this course and uh, developing modules in, for, for um, high schools that could be going into existing courses or brought all together to teach a new course in critical thinking. Um, and, uh, and so that work has been going on with actually the help of the Lawrence Hall of Science. So it's another Berkeley uh, product. The very first unit um, has uh, just come out a few months ago. Um, out of six units, uh, two, one, two of them are in field tests and one is being written for the next round. And so we're hoping that within a year or so, we'll have this full, uh, this full set. And we've been, and so if anybody wants to go look for it, it's at the noahprize.org slash scientific thinking for all is the current name of the, uh, of, of this, uh, this website. Um, and, uh, and there's a big teacher's manual with like, you know, 200 pages uh, for, for help the teachers because they have never taken a course like this. So it's, it takes a little more to, to explain what is it you're doing if you're trying to teach this material, um, in, in a course. Um, You've heard that we've developed the, uh, the university course um, at Berkeley, but it's now starting to spread 
to other universities. And so it's now been taught for a few years at Irvine and at, at Harvard. Um, and Humboldt has, has taken tried at it um, so far. We know that U University of Chicago is picking it up for this coming year. Um, and so we're hoping that there might be some life uh, that will start coming through the universities um, to, to spread, spread these ideas. And we've been working very hard to make all this available for any faculty who want to teach it anywhere um, with, with a website that, that has all the teaching material um, on it, um, including uh, with pa appropriate password, all the quiz problems and the exam problems. Um, and then uh, we've been starting to look at online education, ways to approach um, you know, maybe animations, maybe YouTube uh, videos, working with some of these uh, usual YouTube uh, influencers, you know, the uh, Veritasium and, and others, to see whether we can start spreading it um, through, the, through the more informal routes. And uh, we've also even uh, had a chance to work a little bit with the Exploratorium um, to see whether there could be science museum uh, you know, galleries of, of this kind. I, I, I still like the idea of having an escape room, where after you've learned a number of these techniques, the only way you get out of the room is by using some of them you know, on, on, in a problem. <laughs> so that would that, 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 be kind of fun for a science museum. Um, you don't know whether you've taught any of this unless you come up with ways to test it. And so we put a lot of effort, we got a grant from the Moore Foundation to develop assessment tools um, for this. And we've end up coming up with five different categories of, of questions. And, uh, and so we have started doing the pre-course, post-course comparisons um, every year. And we're seeing uh, what looked like surprisingly um, good uh, you know, motion of, of, the, of, this, of this kind. Um, where we're, we're getting a, you know, a, a fairly broad uh, distribution at the beginning, sharpening up to where, where you want people to get to um, in understanding these ideas. So at least in, in principle, it looks like we can tell whether people are learning this. We have not yet been able to do what I would love to do now is start doing the longitudinal studies to see whether any of this stuff sticks. Do p the students continue to use it? We get you know, anecdotal things like postcards from former students saying, I'm, uh, one student was saying that he was now um, running for, um, for state legislature, and he just wants us to know that he's, you know, he's uh, remembering the course. Um, but uh, but th this, I think, would be very interesting to do. The other group that became interested is, is uh, I don't know if people just followed recently, the latest PISA results came out. These are the compar international comparisons of, of uh, educational uh, attainment in, in uh, countries around the world. And they were very interested in this as well, and they're planning for the 2024 edition to start to test these kinds of, of uh, items. And we hope that that might drive interest in teaching uh, scientific critical thinking um, if, if, uh, if it's starting to be tested and compared between different, uh, different societies. Um, and then, of course, we really treat, see this as just the first attempt at doing this, and that we, if we, uh, or a first attempt at doing this. Now, if we get the example out there, we're hoping that others come up with other ways to, to teach this and other uh, approaches. Um, you know, the, you often will find people will say that you should be teaching something like this, but we felt that there is, it was usually very vague. It didn't have any of the, of the specificity that you have in a curriculum for chemistry or biology. Um, uh, and we thought that if you have a list of these very specific things that you can teach and these things you can test, it would make a big difference. And so that's what we were hoping to exemplify here and that it might uh, stimulate others to, to try these ideas, uh, try to develop other curricula of this kind. So let me stop pretty much there and just say that, you know, what would, can you imagine what it would be like if uh, basic education equipped everybody with this? And, and, uh, and in some sense, maybe is that what we should be now thinking about when we talk about science education? Um, either as much as or maybe even more than do people really understand these concepts of physics, chemistry, biology, much as I love the concepts of physics and chemistry and biology. Uh, I will leave it there with uh, maybe the list of, uh, of topics and just see whether there's any questions if we have time. Yes? Criteria, tools, insights to really be applied critical leading to any thought. But what do you do when you are confronted by reality or academia? So what students are distorting reality real time and there's no chance being given to synthesize or to resolve the actual truth and the falsehood is presented as truth. How do you apply this principle? So I, I assume I should repeat for the for the camera. Do, do, uh, okay. So the question, uh, as I'm as I'm as I'm hearing, is um, 
this all sounds very well if people have the time and the thought and are learning it that way. But what do you do in a, in a, in a world or even a, a university where people are presenting um, you know, positions without pausing to ask, you know, is this right, is this wrong, and how do, how do, you, how do you work with it? And people are presenting realities that are clearly distorted, and they're presenting it as if they're truths. Um, so, so a couple of thoughts in response to that. I mean, clearly this whole educational idea is something that you want to be doing all along the way uh, up to this point, so that by the time you get to the point where people are going to then start an argument, um, they at least all know, they all have a shared understanding that they have a reasonable chance of being wrong. Um, and that that is part of what we we learn about the world, and that and so that and then if somebody says to them, well, you know, can we start discussing you know where where your ideas come from, um, and have you uh, have you considered the you know consider the alternative, you know, have you, what with what confidence do you state these different elements of your story? That at least there'll be a common vocabulary to have that conversation. Now it doesn't help right when you jump in and uh, and somebody is you know loudly declaring a a falsehood, and you say, well. Let's stop and, and teach you, you know, and, and, and discuss 23 different, you know, uh, concepts. Um, uh, you know, now is not the time. That's probably, the, uh, that's probably a little bit too late um, in that situation. On the other hand, you know, we've been teaching this course um, in classes that have students who have very strong uh, points of view. In fact, I've, I've at moments, you know, at the very beginning of the course, you know, somebody will come up to us and they will uh, and they'll describe the thing that they really care about uh, most. Um, and which is a very strongly held political conviction of something, and they're really hoping that that comes out in the course. And it made me a little bit nervous. I found myself thinking, well, how is this all going to work? You know, as we work our way through this course, um, are they going to just keep wanting to bring that up and hammer on that point um, over and over again? And once or twice, there was a little bit of that that I saw in a question that would come from the students. But in general, that wasn't the effect. In fact, I found that at the end of the semester, I was surprised that those same students who I thought would have been kind of annoyed at the, the course would come up afterwards and they say, thank you, that was one of the best courses you know, I've, I've had. Um, and they were recommending it to their departments because that, that, that they, they were starting to hear it as these are the things they wish their opponents understood. Um, and that, and, and, you know, to some extent, and, and I, and that's what I want, right? I mean, you want them, to, you want people to, to feel like, you know, if only every, everybody else understood this, um, then the world would be better because then they might find there's at least the beginning of a place for somebody to then say to them, okay, but, you know, have you thought about this for yourself, you know, on, on, on this particular one? And so I was surprised to discover that so far, um, the students in Berkeley, at least, um, where there are some passionate, you know, viewpoints, Seem well. It's, I also said they're a self-selected group, right? So this the this is the 300 students who chose to take this course. Um, but nonetheless, they there were students who would come up and declare their their prior uh, convictions about you know about a strongly held political belief um, ahead of time, and yet they seem to be responding um, after the whole you know after seeing through a course like this. But uh, it's a good question, you know. <laughs> Jay. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Saul, for this this great lecture. Uh, I was really struck by your examples of something like confirmation bias within uh, modern scientific practice and, uh, and intrigued by what you said about the, the prospects for blind analysis. And um, I just wanted to follow up about that. Could you tell us a little bit more about how blind analysis works in the scientific context <laughs> and then whether there's something analogous to that that might be more broadly applicable outside of scientific? Uh, no, absolutely. The uh, just for, for those who couldn't hear, the, the question is, uh, can I say a little bit more about how the blind analysis story works in both in the science case and also in the more general way? So in the science case, um, a lot of what you need to be able to do when you're doing these scientific analyses is be able to get uh, see the data um, in a form where you can recognize um, where mistakes might be in your, in your uh, data collection. And so what we often do is then uh, intentionally, let's say, add some random constant that we don't know to all the data. So you can see the distribution of the data, um, but you don't know whether it's going to favor one result or the other. Um, that's sort of a, a, an example of the kind of thing. Different problems, of course, have different needs of that kind. Many of the social psychology experiments that we were talking about in the, uh, that other paper I was describing, um, what the, there you might need to do is, is swap the labels randomly of the different groups um, that you're comparing. Um, so you don't know which group is the one that had this effect, which group had that effect. Um, and then afterwards, you get to un un reveal it. But you still need to show yourself something so you can debug your experiment and figure out what's wrong. But the example, I, I sometimes think of this as a little bit like um, 
it's a, a fancy version of the game that we, or the, the thing we were all taught as young children, um, which I always thought was so clever, um, when you're trying to divide a, 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 piece, of, a you know, piece of cake um, between two people, one person uh, you know, chooses and the other person cuts, um, and that the idea being that you blind yourself, you don't get to know ahead of time which one is going to be your piece of cake. Um, and so in some sense, we've all been doing things like a blind analysis um, for most of our lives. Um, we just didn't know it. And I think it's something that, for example, if you're trying to choose you know, what medical advice you know, to take from different web pages, um, you might first try to get somebody to help read the pages for you and tell you how the pages are approaching the problem before you decide which one you're going to uh, take seriously. Um, because otherwise, you'll tend to read the page that you like the answer to you know, and take that one more seriously. And so there are a number of situations in which you may intentionally do the equivalent of you know, basically a wine, wine tasting, you know, where, you, where you hide from yourself, um, which is the one that you were hoping the answer is, um, and until, you, um, until you decide, well, which one do I trust the methodology more? Uh, yes? You told us you talk to the framework. I'm curious, thoughts on if there are certain problems, situations, what this count? So the, the, the situations that worry me, you know, probably most um, are situations where people have gone f beyond rational discussion, right? Where where it's in in either it's you know it's re you know often reached violence, you know, in uh, of them sorts. Because you know there it feels to me like you're you're now no longer even in, in the game of a of a, a of a conversation, and so. You know, this is that's part of the reason I see this as a big educational project um, as a starting point, rather than as a um, immediate conflict resolution uh, you know, approach. It could be that it would help a conflict resolution. I, I I don't know, but the goal is to start building a a, a background, a society um, of citizens and and people who can um, recognize these ideas before you get to the point where people are now in the heat the heat of irrational. You know, fear and, and anger, um, and as much as possible. I think there might be ways in which these could be used in also mediation and in, in, in situations where you know where it's a, a, a hotter situation. But that you know, for today's conversation, I'm, I'm thinking much more from the point of view of let's start getting ahead for the next 20 years and and, and try and get ourselves into a better position. Just because you know you have to start somewhere, um, and and that's I think where the, the start the, the starting point is here. Yes. Is how do you deal with religion? Suddenly in Europe, where two university I went with Gatham University, and the second one in Brussels, and in its charter, uh, we will not have our thinking obscured, disturbing through that, obscured by religious thinking. Uh, how do you see that? Every, every year when we teach this, we, we have at some point, we, we, act, we, we have a moment where we have to decide. You know, how do we want to handle that discussion of how does this relate to people's religious convictions? And it's interesting. I mean, I'd say that um, in general, for most of the students, by the time we've discussed all of this, um, even if they come in with a strong religious conviction, um, they feel like almost all of this is still valuable for them to understand the world uh, that isn't where they don't already know answers from their religious convictions, um, and that in some situations it makes them feel like, well, not every, you know, not, not every religion is, is one that has to take a position on, on all the ways in which we understand reality. Um, and so, so it's, it's, I think, only in certain corner areas of religion that this ends up becoming a, a, a more of a, a potential threat to, to the thinking. One of the things I usually bring up uh, in a course like this is, is the fact that um, Religion is providing for many people something that's a that is has a slightly different goal than the goal of of you know how well are we using reality to make decisions. Um, it has a goal of a certain kind of comfort with 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 the world, and that our our job here isn't to take away people's comfort, right? That's not that's not the reason for doing all this stuff. And so you know, I, I say to people you know that that the they really have to decide you know for if they want to ask a question you know is this something where it's going to really upset them if they if the answer is comes out to be something different than what they expected, um, or is this a place where it's, it's appropriate for them to you know, challenge their, their, their thinking? And 
because you know it, it's too easy you know to feel like we you know you know you know the answer is this you know and of course the whole point of this is not to coming come at people as if you know answers it's to come people as if you are open to questioning the world and so if, if you know if somebody has strong religious conviction I have to be open to to questioning the world you know just as much as I would like them to be. Hi. Uh, so with your blind analysis, uh, blind analysis is can of park of business and it's de adopted essentially in the ranges of science that have very large teams that work for thousands of people. I'm just wondering if you think that you will face more resistance in adopting these techniques for like, science that's conducted on a smaller scale where people are personally involved in the analysis and their funding might depend on how those ingredients go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, we, we haven't discussed about this. And of course, some of the work that we, we, we do is also done in small groups, so that we have, we've had a little bit of experience as well. Um, but what I've been pointing out to them is, is that, you know, in, the, in these situations, is that in the end, as an individual, as a scientist, it doesn't really, really help you to fool yourself either. I mean, because you're going to follow up your own work. And if, you're, if the work turns out to be wrong, you're going to waste another three years tracking down something which is where where it's not based on anything that's actually really out there. It's, it's based on some you know, a misunderstanding of the analysis. Um, and so that you have probably as much motive as anybody else in getting it right. Um, now, maybe not that week. You know, that week, maybe it would be better for you to be able to publish something and, and, and put it on your, uh, you know, on your uh, application for a faculty position or whatever it would be. But, um, but that it's, it, it, it's hard for it not to hurt you in the end if, you are only, if you're only learning things that you think um, that you that you convinced yourself are true, um, rather than that actually have to do with what the the world out there is telling you, and of course, most people who are spending all that time getting involved in doing a science, they do sort of want to know what the answer is, <laughs> what, what what's really out there. So so I think once you can, if you can convince people that this really protects them from uh, from coming up with conclusions that will not hold up, um, you know, the next time around. Uh, with apparently you know that non that replicability crisis of you know what thirty percent uh, being able to be replicated, I think people start to say okay if they can do this in some reasonable way they should. It's not always easy, and so we've been you know trying to help demonstrate how you can build it into systems that currently they all use, um, so they don't have to invent it each time themselves. Uh, try to have some time to enjoy the reception before the building closes at six. Uh, I want to thank you for this very engaging and informative talk and also for your handling this uh, very good questions from the audience. So thank you to the audience too for those good experts. <laughs>